It's the story of child sexual abuse, and more often than headlines can ever tell us, it begins with someone in a position of trust and authority. If you're a parent, a teacher, a school counselor, a healthcare professional, if you care for or work with children on a regular basis, this presentation is for you. It covers a topic that most of us would rather not even think about, but we plan to do just that. Talk openly and honestly about child sexual abuse and its treatment. So, for the next 20 minutes, we hope you listen carefully. Ask yourself some difficult questions. We hope you'll think about the children in your own life. And then, put yourself in the shoes of a parent trying to cope with this problem. If you are a parent dealing with the sexual abuse of a child, we want to help you understand a few simple things as you deal with this experience. First, that you are not alone. Many other families have been in your situation, and many have found I think many people, when they hear the term sexual abuse, child sexual abuse, think about any course, but actually there are many forms. Um, in one case, um, I worked with a 15-year-old girl who, whose father forced her to undress in front of him each night but never touched her. One particular case that stands out in my mind involved a 10-year-old boy who was sexually abused repeatedly by his mother and stepfather. It began by them forcing him to watch when they engaged in sexual intercourse, and that progressed into him actually being an active participant in their sex acts. Every year in this country, mental health professionals hear thousands of stories like these over the course of a child's therapy. This retelling of the child's experience is a core component of their treatment. And so for the purposes of this presentation, we also wanted to let you hear from the children who have been through this experience not just the abuse, but the healing process as well. The following composite account is called a trauma narrative, and it's created by the children themselves through the use of several mediums, including writings, poetry, drawings, music, and play. The details that follow are borrowed from real life case histories. Our hope is that this story will bring home what headlines cannot. For 11-year-old Jamie, what started as a harmless sleepover at her aunt and uncle's house would have repercussions that affected her whole family. Someone she knew well and trusted, in this case her step-cousin, was the offender. 
Parents teach their children to beware of strangers, but in the case of sexual abuse, it's much more typical for the offender to be a neighbor, a family friend, a relative, or some other adult or teenager that the child knows and trusts. Well, sexual abuse offenders can really come from all walks of life. They can come from different cultures, races, and backgrounds. But what we do know is that most offenders are male. And increasingly, we've been concerned that children have, are being sexually abused by teenagers. In fact, some estimates suggest that as many as 40% of offenders are teenagers. Probably the most important part about uh, knowledge about offenders, though, is almost all offenders know their child victims. It's pretty uncommon and almost rare for uh, a stranger to sexually abuse a child. One-fourth of all girls experience some form of sexual abuse before adulthood. There are more children who are sexually abused than children who have asthma, than children who have attention deficit disorder, uh, than children who um, experience many other commonly known medical conditions. Think about it. You probably know at least one child with asthma, or perhaps have a friend whose child is being treated for ADD. Sexual abuse is more common than either of these two very common conditions. If you are a parent already dealing with this problem, you know what I mean. But if you are someone who thinks it hasn't touched your life or the life of someone you know, think again. It's just too common. The next time, I told my mom I didn't want to stay at my aunt and uncle's house. But my mom said, you always have a good time there, Jamie. Plus, you get to stay up late and watch movies. I made a face, but my mom said to hurry so that we could get to Aunt Carla's in time for dinner. That night, Robbie came into our room again. He pushed me over and laid down next to me. I started to cry, but he said it's okay, Jamie. told her it was their secret game. He said that if she really didn't like it, she would have made him stop right away. And since she didn't, he knew that she enjoyed it as much as he did. Then he told her that she'd better not tell her father or she'd be sorry. Like any child, Jamie was scared by what Robbie said. She felt like it was her fault the abuse had continued since she hadn't spoken up and that her father would believe that she wanted her cousin to do those things to her. She was afraid that her parents would blame her for what happened. What is going on in the minds of children who are suffering sexual abuse? Why do they hide their pain? It's one of the most difficult things for parents to understand. I have a daughter. When she was 15 years old, we found out that she had been sexually abused by a close family acquaintance, starting at about age eight. And it had gone on for quite some time before we found out as a family that this had been going on with her. Well, a large percentage of the time, uh, children don't necessarily disclose the abuse directly. With very young kids, sometimes they're engaging in sexually inappropriate behaviors that make parents suspicious that something could have happened and then when they ask their children about it they might disclose at that point. With older kids they will often tell a friend or a teacher or someone close to them who in turn tells uh, someone else whom they know and trust who in turn may tell the parent. Far less than half of all of sexually abused children tell about the fact that they were sexually abused. It's very common for me to see adults who were sexually abused as children and for them to come up and say, this is the first time I ever told anyone that I was sexually abused when I was a child. Even though the child may desperately want to stop the sexual abuse, some children don't tell because they care about the offender or because they don't want the offender to get into trouble. One big reason is just avoidance. 
we want to avoid talking about something painful. They want to avoid talking about something that is very embarrassing for them, something that has a lot of negative connotations. Perpetrators often threaten children, and so kids wind up believing if they do disclose, something bad's going to happen. I had this big, awful secret, and I couldn't tell anybody. Why did my cousin do this to me, and not Maddie? I couldn't sleep at night, and I had a lot of nightmares. Well, children can really display a range of symptoms and problems after a sexual abuse experience. Uh, many children display fear and anxiety. Young children can have nightmares. Many children display recurring thoughts about the abusive experience. If they don't receive effective treatment, children who have suffered sexual abuse may be at increased risk for suffering post-traumatic stress disorder, the same disorder that war veterans suffer, they may be more likely to suffer depression and even substance abuse difficulties in adulthood. In terms of behavioral problems, kids can become very stubborn uh, or not comply with their parents' wishes. Some young children in particular can have some sexually inappropriate behaviors after an abuse experience. In many ways, they're reenacting what was perpetrated against them. Experts know that many cases of sexual abuse are never detected. In many others, the secret does get out. For the child, the sooner the better, because only then can the process of healing begin. But then I thought, this might be okay. For a child, it makes sense that revealing her painful secret will only lead to more problems. They're simply too young to understand the long-term process of healing. And while it's often overwhelming for both children and parents to think about, healing can happen with the right help. My mom was on the phone for a long, long time. When she got off, she seemed really upset. I asked her what's wrong, and she said she was talking with Alice's mom, who had told her what happened. I thought my mom was going to yell at me, but she just started to cry. I never saw her cry like that before. When a parent learns that their child has been sexually abused, the most common first reaction is shock, accompanied by an absolute gut-wrenching hope that it not be true. These feelings are understandable and natural, but responding calmly, as difficult as that might be, and reassuring the child that he or she was brave to tell someone about the abuse, is a good way to start. When we first found out, I think um, our first reaction was a cross between disbelief and anger. Once family members found out, there was a component of denial there. Some people didn't want to believe it. Some uh, of the family members believed it immediately, and then they were sort of on the same page with the rest of us. They felt very guilty. They felt like we had let her down in some way by not noticing it. This can really cause a rift in the family. You'll have family members taking sides. If it was the father, now the family is broken up. Uh, some parents freeze. They're not sure what to say. 
So they, they say nothing or they, they say very little. And the child may perceive the parent as really not interested uh, or not concerned about what the child has said. As a parent, I also see how crucial it is to take a long-term approach and keep your eye on the ball that you are the parent. You have to set the tone of hopefulness, of the long-term goal of recovery. The next day, a police car came to our house. They had all sorts of questions for me about what Robbie had done. Mom kept saying they only wanted to help and that they would keep him away, maybe put him in jail. As you can see, the issues surrounding sexual abuse are complicated to say the least. Families should expect this, but they also should keep in mind a very simple end goal, the long-term treatment and health of the child. You can get there. My daughter and I, once we, f we f you know, she, she told us about her abuse, um, we took a walk one evening and we talked about, okay, how are we gonna, what are we gonna do with this information? And, you know, I had, I told my daughter at that time, I said, I really think we need to get you into some, some form of counseling to help you deal with this. And her reaction to that was, I'm not crazy, I didn't do anything wrong. Um, why do I need to see a counselor? Things were not so great at our house. Then one day, my mom made me a promise. She told me that she would be there for me every step of the way. She also said that she would get me help and make me feel better. While there are some children that suffer the effects of sexual abuse throughout their childhood and even into their adult lives, the good news is that children can recover over time. The odds of recovery are much greater if children get the support they need. I started to see a nice person named Miss Karen. I would go there every week and talk about my feelings and other stuff. At first, I didn't want to talk about what had happened, but after a while, I felt okay about it. Miss Karen helped me understand that what happened was not my fault. She said Robbie knew that what he was doing was not okay. And there really are several components of the trauma-focused approach. Uh, one of the important elements is the fact that we really involve the parents or caretakers in the process. Oftentimes, parents themselves are extremely distraught upon discovering that the child has been sexually abused. And so, naturally, the therapist can help them cope with their own distress while also assisting them in learning skills that will support their child's recovery. It was very powerful to hear her talk about her trauma in her own words with us sitting in the room. A second important component of trauma-focused therapy is really helping children and their parents to develop skills, skills that they can use to help them to deal with the very painful feelings that they've developed secondary to the abuse experience. Affective expression and modulation is a skill which enables a child to identify their feelings and express them. Okay, so what we're going to do today is we're going to do some feelings identification. And what I'd like you to do is, in one minute, name as many feelings as you can, and I'm going to write them down, and then we'll talk about them. Okay? So, can you start naming some feelings? Happy, sad. And many children try to avoid talking about what happened, and they numb themselves. And when you ask these children how they feel, they really can't tell you whether they're angry, whether they're upset or frustrated or feeling anxious. So it's very important for them to be able to name what they are feeling. When a child is constantly telling themselves, this was my fault, I'm to blame, 
I should not have done this, I should have done that. We teach them to stop those negative thoughts and start some positive self-talk. The therapy can help a child understand that the sexual abuse was not their fault. And there was nothing that they did or said to cause the abuse, but rather the offender has the problem. So now that the child and parents have the coping skills to help them deal with the trauma symptoms, it's time to put those skills to use. In the trauma narrative, children tell their story about what happened, but they not only give the specific facts about the sexual abuse experience, but they also share their thoughts and feelings about what happened, their thoughts and feelings about the person who hurt them, and the impact of the experience on them and on their family. If not encouraged to talk specifically about sexual abuse experiences, children do avoid talking about it because it's difficult, it's painful, it brings up sad memories. And everything that happened after she told, okay? And when you first started coming in, we talked about how you were gonna write your own book mm -hmm. about what happened to you. Yeah. So I was thinking today we can get started writing that book. Okay. Now, you can decide where you'd like to start. Do you want to... Children often tell us at the end that even though the trauma narrative was the hardest thing for them to do, as part of the therapy was often the most helpful part of the therapy experience. I'm glad that I got to talk with Karen. I feel much better now. I hardly ever think about what Robbie did to me. And when I do, I don't feel scared anymore. I learned that it's good to tell and to talk about what happened. Based on both clinical experience and research studies, many of the children who go through trauma-focused therapy with their parents show significant improvement in dealing with trauma symptoms and in their ability to lead a normal life. Once again, trauma-focused therapy centers around three core aspects. The first is strong parental involvement with both parent-only sessions and parent-child joint sessions. Second is the development of coping skills that help the child confront the trauma symptoms, emotions, and reminders related to the experience. Lastly, the retelling of the traumatic experience lets the child use these new coping skills and confront the traumatic experience in a safe and caring environment. It is here where the road to recovery truly